Last time on Back to the BBS, we discovered the demo scene. A bunch of artists, programmers and musicians that all got together to make these immense demos. So in the last episode, we met some of those programmers. In this episode, we meet with the musicians behind the tracker music, which was so synonymous with the demo scene. But the tracker scene, or the mod scene after the music format modules, went much further than just the demo scene. In fact, you'd find module tracker music in games and in other software besides. Before the days of MP3s, mods were king. The principle of the mod music format is that it would contain small samples of instruments or voices. The musician would then set a number of patterns to indicate when and how the samples would be played. This was a step up from the chiptune era of the years before, because the samples would be real instruments. As these were the days before lossless compression, most mods would be poorer quality to ensure that the file sizes were small enough to be distributed over low bandwidth modem lines which were atypical of BBSs. Starting in around 1987, on the Amiga, millions of mods were made. The original mod format supported only four channel audio, so enhanced formats came out over the years. Mods were used in most Amiga games and also PC games due to their small size, but it was in the demo scene that they really came into their own. Despite their seemingly antiquated technology, the simple tracker method of music creation is very artist friendly and therefore is still very popular to this day. Despite demos and mod tracker music going together hand in hand, tracker music has its own separate scene too. Yeah, hello, my, my name is Jonne Valtonen and uh, people might know me as Purple Motion. I wrote music in a demo group called Future Crew back in the 90s. I've, I've worked in games, music, audio, and I've, I'm also a composer and written a lot of concert work and all these kind of things. So this kind of tracker thing we did earlier sort of stick and now I'm doing it as my main living. G'day, my name is Chris, otherwise known as Citrix. I'm from Australia and I've been playing music, uh, especially tracked music from the uh, Commodore Amiga for many, many years since I was, yeah. <laughs> I was in single digits uh, as an age. Yeah, hello, I'm Peter, uh, known as Skaven of the Future Crew. I'm like the other Future Crew musician. And yeah, I did some music for their demos as well. And uh, after that, I joined the game industry. So I'm working in the game industry now and currently doing primarily sound design and also some particle effects. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Mark Knight, um, AKA, AKA TDK. Um, and I'm a current video games composer and sound designer and a bit of a chiptune musician as well. Um, so about 1990, I came across the Amiga uh, in person for the first time. I mean, I'd seen them, you know, in stores and things and been like, that thing, <laughs> I need that thing. Hello, in today's program, I'll be taking the lid off the machine they're all talking about. This is the new Commodore Amiga, and it can do a lot more than the micros you may be used to. And to show that, well, let's try another demonstration here, this Boxes demo. Then I'll stretch that one again, move it to the top, make it a bit bigger. Now, you'll notice that the Lines program carries on running. And in fact, all the time I've been speaking down here, hiding away, is yet another program. This is another nice facility, being able to bring the screen on. So you see, we've got three programs going there. This, you see, is a multitasking machine. In fact, it's got a 32-bit microprocessor, and that means it works on chunks of data four times the size of conventional 8-bit machines, and it uses modern chips, which are faster anyway. Here's the motherboard from inside, and this is the 32-bit microprocessor. The smart design doesn't stop there, though. Here are some custom chips, specially designed chips. These two here handle the graphics and the animation, and this one handles just the sound. So the processor doesn't have to do all the thinking for the machine. It can delegate certain specialist tasks while it gets on with other things. Sound is normally the forgotten feature of a micro. 
traditional sound chips give you a rather crude quality. But with custom-built chips, you can get quality like this. I find that pretty stunning. That is actually stereo sound. And it's a sign of how seriously they take the sound facilities of this machine that you can get more sounds by loading in directly the digitized sound files from the Fairlight, one of the most sophisticated of the professional computer musical instruments. Uh, if you don't fancy the old uh, strings touch, what about this one? But eventually came across a friend who had one and um, yeah, got a very early version of Noise Tracker and just went down an absolute rabbit hole. And that's um, kind of never stopped, you know, I, I did take a break for a little bit playing in metal bands and doing some prog fusion stuff, but you know, by the time I was 19, 20, I'd, I'd started looking at all these other platforms that I'd, you know, seen over the years, Commodore 64 and the things like the Mega Drive and things like that. I was like, I wonder how you write music for these things. And it turned out you used tracking software very similar to everything I'd used as a kid on the Amiga. So, um, yeah, so I started writing music for the Mega Drive and the C64 and then the Game Boy and the Nintendo and the Super Nintendo and the uh, Vectrex and uh, the MSX and the Atari ST. The list kind of goes on. Um, even uh, the GPX uh, open source uh, little consoles. There's a little program called Piggy Tracker I was using there. And then eventually I came across the Atari 2600 and I was like, well, I wonder if this thing can actually make any music. Um, and according to the documentation, uh, the answer was no. It doesn't contain any melodic sounds. It's all just noise generation. But it turns out that you can make music <laughs> with this. So I kind of uh, wrote a translator program that generated uh, machine code uh, for the Atari 2600. But it all started from a tracker, actually. Um, you know, I'd use a piece of tracker software to write the track and then uh, translate a text file out of that tracker into Assembler, which would then generate music for the Atari 2600. So, you know, tracking in my life is, is pretty huge. I mean, it's pretty much anything I do with music uh, is not, not everything, but I'd say 80% of it involves a tracker. So uh, you've, um, you've been in the industry for quite some years, Mark. Is that fair to say? <laughs> I think it's fair to say, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Twenty, I think, uh, twenty nine years in uh, in in a month, month and a half, or something like that. So, so you know, going back twenty nine years, then um, almost thirty years, um, that really, really takes us um, into into a very exciting period of time in in technology overall. Um, yep. What were you doing at the beginning? What was it that you were doing when you were uh, presumably a teenager or, or, or there or thereabouts? Well, that's it. I mean, I mean, sort of like so. The history for me uh, is how I even got into all of this stuff. I was a pretty mad cyclist as a ten-year-old, um, to, to the point that <laughs> my my dad was um, was a policeman, and uh, I, I, for some stupid reason, decided to ride, race a police car down a really steep hill down near where I lived in Brighton um, and they kind of mentioned to him that if I carried on riding my bike the way that I was going they'd be scraping me off the pavement <laughs> so so the bike went um, and then along came a Commodore 64 which um, I fell in love with straight away um, the main thing I fell in love with obviously was, was the sound although um, may, 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 maybe after a few months um, I don't think things like Frogger and that had great sound um, and uh, it, it just really, really pulled me into this synthetic, structured, melodic noise that this that it, this machine was making. Um, and so I dabbled in writing music for it. And, and then as things progressed, the Commodore Amiga came out. So the second-hand Commodore 64 got sold and the second-hand Commodore Amiga got bought. And uh, I started kind of yeah well geeking basically you know instead of going out and playing with mates i was pretty much sitting in my bedroom tapping away at the keyboard tracking these little chip tunes which they, they were in various demos um and then ended up being used as as um crack tro uh, tunes for for, <laughs> for the introductions for pirated video games <laughs> which <laughs> There we go. Um, I kind of like went from one side to the other, so to speak. Um, 
but it, it was it was a really exciting time. Um, the, 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 the way that the the sound was progressing from synth synthetic noise to sampled noise in the Amiga, and suddenly I had the ability as a as a as, as a 16 year old, I think I was with the Amiga, to to write a piece of music with a real piano sound and. Um, it, really really exciting times my only other experience of, of that sort of quality music was um, at, at, at um, a shop in Brighton called Future Music which had all these wonderful amazing synthesizers which were you know 1500 pounds 2000 pounds and I you know I just sit there and drool at them and then suddenly we had this this under 500 pound machine that could play all of the sounds that those expensive machines could play, maybe not as such good quality, but uh, yeah, it, it literally pulled me in um, and hasn't spat me out yet. All I can really state um, are my experiences with, you know, downloading music uh, off of BBSs. That's actually what I got into before the demo scene. I had found Track Blaster and uh, it said, the, the description on the, the BBS was very enticing. It was something like, you know, multi-channel digitized music uh, through your sound blaster. And I was like, I was downloading everything that said that, but Track Blaster uh, by someone named Volker Zink, I believe, I hope I have that name right, he's German. Um, he had created a tracker, uh, play, well, everything was called a tracker back then, even if it was just a player. Even if it, if all it did was play mods, uh, it was called a tracker. Uh, that was just the, the slang, the vernacular at the time. And Track Blaster could play on a 286 or, well, technically an XT, but um, for practical purposes, a 286 or higher. And if you had a Sound Blaster, it would play mods. And it came with a mod called Unveiled.mod, written in 1989 by two people whom I forget. And I remember playing this thing and just being utterly blown away. And it is actually my pursuit of trying to download mods and understand those and downloading um, mod edit, which is, it was terrible for the time, um, but it was all we had. Mod edit and the original screen tracker and things like that. My pursuit of trying to chase mod playing is actually one of the things that helped, you know, nudge me closer and closer to the demo scene. So uh, I still have lot, tons of floppy disks, practically untouched, where I would just simply download mods and mods and mods and then organize them onto floppies. And I still have like 30 of them in my closet. Um, eventually I'll read them all and listen to how bad they were. To, to both of you, how old were you when you both started out in the demo scene in the future crew? I think I was 15 or 16, I guess. 15, I, I think. Well, the first music I did was Mental Surgery demo for Future Group. The music, which is a huge Uncle Tom rip-off piece. But uh, uh, yeah, that's how I sort of got in to the to Future Group. I, 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 they even did, didn't even say that I'm on the group. I just saw the demo and I was listed as a member. So I thought, that, OK, I'm, I'm a member now. So I, I think I was 15, <laughs> so very young. That was just it, that you were in. You just did yeah, a bit of music. Yeah, like nothing, not, nothing, anything spectacular or anything. How many members of the crew were in it at that point in time? Not many. I, I think three. I, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not actually sure if Gore Samuli Syvahuoko was there at that time either. So, but uh, I, I think it expanded quite quickly after that mm. intro. So, so, and I, I think. Uh, Peter came something like half a year later or something, joined to the group, I, I, I think, if, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I'm not sure when I actually joined the Future Crew officially. I was in contact with uh, PSI, Sami Tammilehto, the programmer for Future Crew, uh, because he made a screen tracker, the first screen tracker, and yeah. I found a bug in it. So I got in touch with him about the problem, and he sent me a new version, and we made friends, and I visited him. and. All that so I that was before you joined Future Crew, Yonne. But uh, oh, really? I'm, I'm okay. not sure if I was a member of Future Crew at that time. Yeah. They oh. were just doing stuff. And, yeah. uh, okay, was... I just remember the member list on the on the on the on the mental surgery demo. It, that made a huge impact. I was in my well, being a 15 year old kid who's very much in this this music thing. So 
if you if you put your mind back to the 1980s, um, really the big thing that had come along that had revolutionised music was MIDI, um, and you could buy. Uh, you know, devices like this is from 91, I think, that has a, a floppy drive in it that actually allows you to record, you know, parts and then you can go to the next part and record it in. The problem is this was really designed for musicians, you know, people who would plug in a, a MIDI keyboard and play, and it was also expensive. This was double the price of, say, buying a Commodore Amiga or a, you know, it was probably about the price of a of a, a cheap PC by the time you added a controller keyboard to it and, you know, and the rest of it. So. Um, there was always the ability to do events listing uh, and you know even on the Commodore 64 they'd written programs where you know you could sort of take make a track by you know putting in things in a, in a certain order in a, and then saying okay I want these notes to play together and this and you would almost transcribe it across or there was MIDI files that you could sort of convert to get the notation but there wasn't really a solid events list style way of writing um, that made sense for tracker music. You've got to look at the limitation of what you're working with to really create an interface that's ideal for it. And in the case of, say, the Amiga, which is sort of really where the digital tracker format started, was you had four tracks, uh, a chip inside called the Pooler chip, which could do memory access to four channels of digital audio. So that meant that you could tell the chip, I want to play from this place in memory to this place in memory and just play that audio and loop it. And it could do that four times and you could tell it to go at a certain pitch and then you could tell it to, uh, there was a certain other things you could get it to do that would sort of change the way it sounded. So because of that, um, it was really clever because the Amiga had this subsystem where it used zero CPU to play back four channels of audio as long as you were just reading from memory. It was just, just sit there and do its own thing. So very quickly, you know, it became apparent, well, we need somewhere somehow to do this, but for every time we do a screen refresh, we need to be able to, you know, change what's going on uh, with that chip. So uh, a gentleman called Carsten Obarski created a, um, a package called uh, the Ultimate Sound Tracker. It was about 1987. And this really answered that issue. It had four almost like Excel spreadsheet style, you know, drop downs. Uh, and you would uh, put in, you know, for, for each single time, uh, you know, it, it addressed a line. Uh, you would put in what the note was playing. Now you could set different speeds, so it was basically how many refresh rates of the screen. And so in PAL, uh, your screens were 50 hertz. In the States, you were 60 hertz screens, and you'd say, I want to wait, say, six screen refreshes, and then play the next line. Six screen refreshes, the next line. So it would just go ding, 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 ding down the list. So I've got a kick drum. Then you've got your bass on track two, which is but you know you might put things in between that because you've got these spare spaces. So you might have a guitar that's going wow, so you're going dong dong wow to wow wow to wow 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 wow, and swapping between the notes, and it's just stepping down, and it plays quick enough. And of course you get this and that's your first two tracks, and then your third track might be a synthesizer where you're you know, creating a nice like uh, synth pattern of. The thing is, you've got to remember is unlike something like a Commodore 64 that could only generate one waveform at a time, something that's in a tracker format is just a piece of waveform. You can save a full chord. So you could save two hands worth of a chord, like ding, like these big power chords and just have that pitching up and down. And as long as you did a major and a minor, if you or into your music theory, you know, you know, that's covered a lot of your, you know, sounds. You might do a suspended, so that's like a slightly different chord again. And between those three chords, you can put them in and suddenly you've got your synth line, your bass line and your drums. And that gives you a spare channel to, you know, start putting your melody in or little vocal hits or things like that. So it was really four columns. You know, you've got those four columns, you're stepping through it at a certain speed. What is going to happen in that period of time? And it's very different to writing modern music. You know, modern music, you have windows and windows and bits and micro clips and all of these things that are, for me, like really three dimensional and complicated. Whether the Amiga kept it super simple, you see every single thing all the time on your screen. And the genius about it was that it would send it to a dedicated chip, especially on the Amiga, where it would just sit and play back and take pretty much zero CPU, maybe 0.5% CPU. Because all it was doing was just playing these like bits out of memory and looping it around and occasionally going, oh, what am I playing now? Okay, those, you know, eight things, all right, or those four notes now. Okay, so I'll jump to that position in the sample and play. So 
It was just a very organic, clever way of getting music to play back. And very early on, there was it was like a module. So, um, and a module encompassed all the samples, so all the resources that you would have that you that were making up your drums, your bass, your keyboard sounds, your chords. So all a, a big chunk of that, which was pretty much just a memory dump of what was happening sequentially in memory, and then just a whole load of what's happening per screen refresh, you know, with that block of memory. And that became the module farm. Uh, tractor music was, you needed samples to do make the music, yeah. and uh, most of us didn't have any good samplers, so it was much more convenient to find existing Amiga mod songs and then just borrow the samples from them. Yeah, yeah. And be like, oh, you know, can we find some mod files? And you know, I was just that annoying kid, I guess, you know, who just wanted to, at any expense, find mod files. And there was a reason for that, and that was because people forget about the tracking formats, that when you got a mod file, it was very different to modern audio formats. You actually get all the instruments, you get all the samples, you get everything with that file, and it was a very open sort of community where people, you know, you'd put your samples out there almost for the community. Once you'd released a track, if it had fresh sounds in it, then everybody could take them and start using them. So um, it was always a mission to find the tracks that had, you know, clean, good audio, like bass notes and drum kits and sounds in them that I could take and use for my own tracks. So, you know, it was this sort of, uh, I don't know, this adventure of just trying to find files. But, you know, being on a BBS board when you're a kid, uh, there's, it, there was a certain hierarchy on the BBS boards in their, their culture where, you know, the music was kind of, you know, it was kind of cool, but it wasn't really, you know, a, a super elite kind of level of stuff to, to give and take. You know, for one, it was the files were still fairly large. I mean, obviously a lot smaller than, you know, just a straight audio file, but, you know, they were still in the, the magnitude of 200, 300K, so even a small mod would be maybe 90K. So that's a, a little bit of bandwidth for them to have in terms of storage on you know the hard disk, which was very precious, hard drive space. So you know you, you would you sort of have to hunt a little bit. Mods wouldn't always last that long on a BBS, you know, before they disappeared. And then you had to get credits, you know, you had to give something back. So that was where my mate was like, well, you you have to start giving us some of your mods because then he can upload and get like the points and be seen as giving you know new content to the BBS board. And then that sort of gives you a little bit more kudos on the hierarchy of, of a BBS board. But then of course you've got to remember as well the, the cost of connection. Because I lived in a fairly uh, regional area and it was we had what's called STD rates, which was your um, yeah, sort of statewide rates, and it wasn't super cheap to connect. You know, you're paying three dollars an hour kind of thing for a connection. And I was I was quite lucky that when I went around to my friend's place, you know his mum would be like, oh, you can have an hour on the, the modem, you know? And it would be this thing that only somebody with a modem as a kid would understand, but the parent would be picking up the phone every now and again just to check if they were still on the line, like, get off the internet, get off the PBS. So, it, it, you know, it was quite a mission to, to get files and, and give stuff back, and, and especially when you started out and you didn't have any kudos points. And I guess being very young, and just wanting to be in this adult world of BBS land, you know, it was very, uh, it was very hard to access <laughs> when you didn't, you know, you, you didn't really have anything other than a bunch of floppy disks and some friends that, you know, had this access that would get you things. So it was a fascinating time to, to sort of, uh, to be around music in its early form on the, the I guess, what's the pre-internet. How would yeah, you actually go through that process of uh, of ripping them off? Like, how, what what would you do? Let's say that um, Anarchy brought out a new demo. It wouldn't be long before the module had been ripped and uploaded onto a BBS, and then it's like, well, for for people like me, uh, that was a new source of samples. <laughs> so you you download the the format tune or whom, whomever it was. Um, uh, load it into the tracker, and then the you had the ability to wipe the memory um, in different ways. So you could you could remove all the samples, you could remove all of the sequencer information, or you could remove everything. So a lot of a lot of the time, we were loading in these modules and then removing the the sequencing information, 
the sequence of patterns. So, uh, and then we've got all the samples there. And then we just write something completely different depending on how the sounds inspired you. Yeah, Screen Tracker was able to import Amiga mods. So you could just yeah. open an Amiga mod and then save the samples out of it. Yeah. Or you could just uh, load a whole, if you just use this the sample set of one song, you could just import that song and yeah. then delete all the note data and then just compose your own music using those same samples. Yeah. You didn't have many musical instruments back in those days then? No, no. I, I mean, it was impossible to sample because the, all the, the sound cards that were for PC that Future Crew sort of worked on, the, it was quite impossible to sample any sounds. There was a lot of hiss and noise in there, like the first sound blasters, pretty much unusual. And uh, the, then the files became so big that you couldn't use them on a on a piece because obviously space was an issue back then so so that's the reason why I, I, and Amiga had a really good like sampling uh, and Atari I think they were able to sample quite small samples and they had nice editors and such and so at least that's uh, that's my excuse for it <laughs> Yeah, we didn't have any good sample editors for PC yeah. either until PSA made one called yeah. the Advanced DigiPlayer. It was the coolest ever because it used a, like a scrolling screen. It has such yeah. a huge number of buttons and menus and you could just scroll across and do the editing. And that's I, I when think it was... the samples still were too big to use. I mean, even if you try to, try to resample and try to make them sort of smaller. Did you better do this kind of... Do you sample your own stuff? Uh, I mean, I, well, uh, back then I didn't, I didn't uh, have the facilities to do so, but yeah. yeah, several years later, like when I was, I don't remember when, like I had a Casio CZ101 synthesizer and a Korg TR rack and I took some samples out of them. But during that time, actually the buzz checker was becoming a thing. It was like a, a virtual door. You could like ha add these synthesizer plugins to it and build signal paths and that offered a way to make samples as well. So you could like play a chord with Buzz Tracker and render it out into a sample and you would get much cleaner results than trying to sample from hardware with the, hard with the sound cards that we had available. Yeah. So how did you actually get into electronic music? What, what, Peter, what, what was it for you that got you into it in the first place? Well, the first time I heard the music of Jean-Michel Jarre, and uh, Tangerine Dream, I was like, what is this? This is awesome. There's no crappy drums or crappy singing, just glorious synthesizer sounds. And I <laughs> wanted to be able to make, to make my own, but it was still several years from there before I was actually able to. And yourself, Yoni? Yeah, well, pretty much the same. And, and Jan Hammer was obviously really cool. And all the synthesizers, synthesizer bands back then. Well, I was also sort of, I was playing classical piano and such, so I sort of listened to classical music as well, but I really love synthesizer stuff. And like Yare, I, I remember we listened to him a lot back in the days. So so that was quite an inspiration. I, 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 I'm pretty sure I'm on some kind of autistic Asperger's kind of spectrum. Um, and to have been lucky enough to find a career that's my hobby, that I love and I love to do every day, I think is quite a rare thing for a lot of people. Um, so, you know, and and the, the luck of it, you know, the, the, the fact that when I was 19 years old, writing out my application for management training at Sainsbury's supermarket, um, that very day, Mindscape phoned me up responding to me having sent floppy disks of my Amiga tunes to as many developers as I could find the addresses of um, and asking me if I would be interested in a bit of freelance work doing the music for Wing Commander and it's like the very day I was filling out this form to go and train to put apples on the shelf um, <laughs> and uh, no dis disrespect to people but it wasn't my thing you know my thing was computers and music and and then, uh, yeah, literally was a case of, there was a magazine that had the addresses of every UK developer there was in, you know, in the UK. So I, yeah, I just copied a load of my, my tracker mods onto floppies, stuck them in an envelope and sent them off to everyone. Um, I got a few 
replies back, you know, thanks but no thanks, we'll keep you on file. Um, I don't think, I, I didn't hear anything from, from Mindscape at all, I don't think. Because um, I must have done that. Um, oh, when would I have done that? I would have done that leaving, leaving college, which would have been... Uh, how old are you when you finish college? Is it 18? So it, it must have been at least six months beforehand. And and, and yeah, um, I got a phone call from a guy called Richard Leinfelner, um, who historically, he, he formed Palace Software, who did games like Barbarian, um, Sacred Armor of Antiriad, Antiriad. And Richard, I think, Barbarian and Barbarian 2 were, were two that he programmed himself. Um, and Mindscape had been using a guy called Richard Joseph for a lot of their work um, and Richards uh, he was very much a, a musician through and through they contacted me and I th I, I, th I think they asked me how much it would cost and I had absolutely no idea um, of what to charge anybody so I think I quoted 800 pounds um, and uh, which they which they accepted. Um, I ended up having to go back and ask for some more <laughs> because it was taking quite a bit longer. Uh, Wing Commander had quite a few tunes um, and it was also orchestral. So um, I was, I think I was struggling to get the quality from the samples that I, I really wanted from, 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 from the machine. I just remember it, the introduction. It was the very orchestra tuning. It was so visceral. There was nothing else quite like it at the time. So, the, so there was the, the, the sort of um, the graphic itself was, uh, you know, kind of like shaded, and uh, and then there was guys running to the, you know, their um, the the, the, the planes and and so yep. forth. But the music, um, if you had put it on mute or if unplugged your speakers or whatever, it would have just been an animation and it wouldn't have drawn you in. There was a sense of urgency right from the get-go, and, and, and you felt like that game was a big deal. I've used this story a few times now because it is really <laughs> quite funny. I'm, I'm, I'm probably lucky to have kept that job because, um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure it was in my first week, but you know what things are like over the years. It gets a bit fuzzy. It might have been in my second week or whatever. But I, I, I was walking past the production room and I was very, very green. I was 19 year old, you know, the first day there I wore a suit and I was told never to wear it to, to work again. Um, and they were playing one of my chip tunes in the production office. Why they, what's going on? Because I, I don't think I put any chip music on, on, on my showreel. So I stuck my head around because they had downloaded off of ABBS a cracked version of a game that they just released called Moonstone, which had my music on the crack trope. <laughs> Luckily, <laughs> just credited TDK. So I kind of reversed, walked back out of the room, went into my little room, shut the door and said no more of it. Because I, I'm guessing, had they tweaked the thing? The thing is, like, all I literally did was I'd write music, I'd stick it on a floppy disk, I'd send it to Copenhagen. I had absolutely no idea most of the time what then happened to that music, unless it was something that was specifically asked for. So I, I did, I did the music for a demo called um, the Tetris demo, um, and they wanted something kind of Russian sounding for that, and so I did something that was Hungarian. <laughs> um, but other than that, I, I really didn't know what was going to be used in what. Um, and most of the time, I never got to find out because it's not like, oh, we'll send you a copy of the crap game or, or whatever. So I'm only finding out now when I look on YouTube, you know, and there'll be the Moonstone crack trow and there'll be the Green Hornet crack trow and, and all these things. It's like, oh, oh, right, okay, that used it and that used it. and <laughs> But I had no idea. I remember seeing the Amiga. I was like very, very young, um, you know, preschool kind of age. And I went to a Commodore Expo with my dad as I used to live in the UK. And I actually saw the Amiga 500 pretty close to launch um, and just remember seeing this computer that was playing 
stuff that was like digital sound and had cool crazy graphics and was like amazing and we still had like you know a black you know a green screen PC that I'd had no interest at all at home and then we had a um, Commodore 64 so I actually started on the C64 with um, this uh, music tracking program which or sorry music composing program that sort of had this strange combination of putting notes on a staff and then there was this semi piano roll thing that was just very awkward to write music with but you know, I'd stick with it and even as a, you know, five-year-old, six-year-old, I'd sit and play with this Commodore 64 uh, program and mostly make noise in it. Um, but I think it was sort of when I was about 10, 10 years old or so that I saw a friend who had an Amiga and was just like, wow, this is the best thing I've ever seen, you know. And it was, um, it was a little bit after the Amiga 500 had sort of come out and wasn't sort of the latest thing anymore. So, you know, the, the kids were getting them uh, a bit more and just to go around and, and, and I remember the first time I saw a music disc uh, and, and they only had one, but you'd play it and it was like an album on a disc. And I think like most kids, like this person had an older brother who was sort of getting right into it. So I was able to ask them as much as I could, but they didn't really know any answers to my questions. Like, how do you make these tunes? You know, how do I do this myself? So I, I sort of slowly uh, figured out that I needed a tracker and, and I needed something uh, to, I think I got an Amiga format magazine at some point and looked and, and figured it out. But I got a copy of Noise Tracker um, and then I was able to go around to my friend's place and um, and yeah, basically write tracks on this, this Amiga and it was just wild. and. Um, it was funny because like I, I could borrow the Amiga sometimes off them, but in between times we, you know, we had a PC and we'd, um, but it was it was like it was a 4.86, I think SX25 when they first sort of came out, and uh, it was just like how do I do this on a PC? So I eventually found, um, you know, I, I was went down to our shareware local shareware store and eventually found that they had a disc, you know, with this mod editor program and took that home, I was like, surely this is an editor for those files, and I was able to bring it up, um, and sure enough, you know, I could, it was it was very scratchy and didn't sound anywhere near as good as the Amiga, but I could actually work on files and write stuff, and then using CrossDOS, take it back to the Amiga at my friend's place, and go, yeah, check out what I made, you know. But then traversing from, uh, from the music of synthesizers to then go into the demo scene, um, it's, it's quite a change. How did, how did that come about? Mm, I, I don't know. It's not really that big of a change. Uh, for, for at least for a young person who wasn't able to buy any synthesizers because they cost a lot back then and they still cost quite a lot. So, so having this possibility to use like put all the note data you have the sequencer and and all the samples and everything sort of put together and actually make music and you're it's it's free i mean you can do it free you don't have to buy anything except the sound card obviously so i, I think that sort of that was quite natural transition and i was i, I remember when i uh, actually i was on the same class with psi's sami tamilehtos a uh, little brother on, on high school so I just heard that his big brother was doing this, like similar kind, like Pro Tools. Uh, no, sorry, Pro Tools. Uh, oh my God, Amiga Tracker kind of uh, software for PC. And I was like, oh my God, that's like great. So I just one day I got just visited him there, and I saw that he was doing Scream Tracker too. And I was like, oh my God, this is the best thing ever. And, he really didn't give me, well, I've told this quite a few times, but he didn't want to give it out, obviously, because he was afraid that, you know, the, the zero day bears thing was quite a big thing back then. So, so I, I just, I just kept pestering him also because I was so ex excited about it. And we had only a PC and I, my parents didn't want to buy me an Amiga. So, so the first, actually the first piece I did was, uh, I wrote, I wrote this grid paper and I sort of wrote the tracker piece to that with a pen and tape, paper and I, I brought it to Sami Damle, Sami and he wrote it down and it sounded horrible and uh, <laughs> but sort of after that he sort of, it took me a couple of weeks and he gave me the software and I could sort of beta test it. As well. How did you I, write I the music on the grid paper? What kind of notation was it? Was yeah, it like yeah. a letter notes or? No, I just wrote it like it would look like on tracker. So I just wrote it like. <laughs> so I, yeah, 
I was really excited about it. But I think it was the same time that you were also sort of beta testing it, I guess. I know. Yeah, I found out about Screen Tracker from uh, another friend of mine who was not a demo senior or a future crew member, but he uh, passed the. Uh, he was uh, more active in BBSs than I was, and he had downloaded uh, Screen Tracker and he copied it to me and I started using it and I was like oh my god I can finally actually write music and save it on a disc and yeah. have a whole song contained in one file that's amazing because if you buy a synthesizer that's not enough you would also have to buy like yeah. a sequencer and a mixer and all that yeah, so yeah, yeah none of us had Compressor any of that stuff. yeah but with a tracker you had everything in one package and you could just install it to your computer so there was no problem with expenses yeah. And Screen Tracker 2, uh, like uh, PSI was working on it, but he never released it, so it never came really? out. So instead, we got Screen Tracker 3, which was the fancy looking version with multiple channels and that uh, khaki or beige interface, if yeah. you remember that. Yeah. Screen Tracker 2 was, it had like ANSI graphics, it had yeah, these I mean, multiple windows that you could open and yeah. resize and scroll around. But I never saw that like come out, actually. Did you use it? Yeah, I did use it a lot, actually. Well, I never got to use it myself, so I oh, okay. switched well, from okay. the first Screen Tracker to Screen Tracker yeah. 3. But it, I, I think it was only four channels as well, so the Screen Tracker 3, it had like multiple, much more channels to be used, so that was really great. But I, I think I, I, my computer, that was, I, I think I was, I had like 286 computers, so it was very slow, and I, I would barely just run the whole screen tracker, <laughs> even in that it was in MS-DOS and the ANSI graphics and such. So, but that was like the coolest thing ever. I, I think my first sound card was a Kovos, Kovox, you know, this kind of... Yeah, it was a weird hack that in. you would into a printer port yeah. and it uh, would output sound. It was yeah. like self-built and it, it sounded like... <laughs> and is there something coming, like noise coming out from there or something? And it was a, well, it was a bit better than actually having to use the PC speaker because that was also an op option, and that was like total distortion. So, so that was, yeah, yeah, you could you could actually use a, a a PC speaker back in the day for digitized audio, but it was pretty horrible, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 it was. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um. For the for the people of who are the un, uninitiated on uh, who, are, who are watching, when when you have a, a, a tracker, how do you actually lay down music on it? I mean, because you just said that you made music there pretty much with graph paper. I mean, that's incredible. I mean, how do you <laughs> how do you actually make music in these in these tracker apps? How did how did it work? Well, it looks and works pretty much like a spreadsheet. So you get this spreadsheet kind of a table and the program just ro scrolls down this table and plays whatever notes that are along it. <laughs> kind of like a piano roll on a pianola, you know? Mm. And then you, you could, these, uh, each of these sequences was like called a pattern. You would have these single pages, single spreadsheets that have like one pattern of music. And then you had a, what was it called? A sequ uh, I'm not, was it an order list? Yeah, or ar arrange yeah. these patterns one after another to play a whole song. Yeah. So you could repeat patterns. And, and the other thing, of course, um, to, to be aware of for, for, for people who aren't aware of Tracker is that whilst the keyboard was QWERTY, you used it like a piano keyboard. So with white notes and black notes. So C was Q, D was W. <laughs> E was E? <laughs> yeah, E was E. So that was good. F was R. G was T. So you, you kind of had to visualize in your head this, this piano keyboard. When you, so, so you weren't typing in the actual names of the notes. You were typing in the notes as if it was a piano keyboard. Uh, the, yeah, the checker notes, they were like, first you had the letter of the note, C, D, E, F, and so forth and maybe a sharp sign if it was a sharp note. And uh, then after that came the number of the instruments that you would play. Uh, and then the next number was the volume of the note. And then you had a column for special commands. So you could yeah. uh, have portamento or volume slide on the notes and arpeggio, what have you. 
And the thing was that you could hear when you wrote that one note, you could hear the actual pitch and the actual sample what you wrote. So basically, you and then you were able to just go to a some segment of of, of the pattern and just play it from there. So so you could actually hear it at the same time you were sort of writing it. So it wasn't just like like you put a lot of notes here and then you listen to it and it sounds horrible. But you would actually already while you were Writing and, it, and you would, yeah, it real would sound time. horrible too. But, <laughs> but yeah, immediate real time preview. It just it, that was yeah. very user friendly. So even though the interface looks horrible, it was quite quick to do music because yeah, you could was... immediately hear what you were doing. When you're making a track for a demo, the first question is: you've got your crew of people, usually from the same city. In in our case, we got disaster area. We're mostly from Melbourne. Uh, it's like, uh, all right, how how many how much space have I got? For the tune or oh, about 120k see how you go so you know you start making the track it's like is there any effects i can't use that are going to take cpu that we need for the demo I'm like oh just give it a crack see how we go we could take them out if you need to later so you start building your track and you've got to keep it within the restraints of the file size and then there's this thing of um it's called direction and i find that the musician probably has more input to this than, than people realize thing it's just it's a musician secret uh, because the demo will generally follow the the pattern of the music or in, de, in my experience a good demo should follow the music so you've got your introduction sequence and then maybe do, 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 and that holds a you know a, a, a logo for a second then and that'll do something before it kicks in so you're almost giving all the cues in fact a good track if you're a a musician thinking about the demo, you're actually writing a track that you know is going to give good cue points to the programmer. Hey! And you're actually saying, you know, in fact, in the tracker, you use well, we use the 8 command, which doesn't really do anything on the Amiga, and 8 command is still there, and the, the tracker software can read it, but it can just look for those 8 commands, and you know, it'll swap to different things and trigger different parts of the demo depending on what command you put in at that point on that vertical spreadsheet. Obviously, it means you can't use, because you've got your, um, your note, you've got your instrument, you've got an effect, uh, which will do something like vibrato, like do instead of do, or it'll do a volume ramp or something. But you can use that effect as just markers for the demo. So you end up marking out your track as you're writing it for events to happen. And then the programmer starts sending you stuff like, all right, I've got these effects, this stuff, and one of the other coders, and the graphics are sort of, I always, I don't know why, but I end up being the person that all this stuff gets sent to, and I'm sort of running these executables of, half-baked effects that are almost sort of like working. And you go, oh cool, I think this would be interesting for this amount of time and this for this. And you start kind of rejuggling where your parts of your song are based on seeing all these things come in. And then you're like, all right, so I think we should start with this. We'll start with the title, we'll start with that, we'll start with the zoomer, and then we'll we'll cut to the logo, and then we're gonna have a lens effect go over. The lens effect looks really cool. Can we hold that for this? Can we the, the, this goes for 30 seconds. Can we do some variations on the lens? And the program is just like, oh, I got it working. They, they're not thinking about, oh, I could do different things with this. <laughs> so they're like, oh, I'll see what else I can do with it. You know, it's, it's, really, it's really one thing to make a demo. What a lot of people don't realize, especially on the older hardware, is to get a demo to go from, what we call it linking, from part one to two to three to four to five without a big screen glitch or a reloading to get everything in memory as well and to get it so that it all works as one continuous thing generally only happens the day before the party or on the day of the party. You're just there like trying to get everything working and, and as a musician you have to sometimes like, you know, give them a, you've given them a shorter version of the track just in case. Memory was an issue, so so sometimes you needed to have like more time for a piece, so you just repeated the pattern many times, so that so that because it, it also took memory to write down those notes, like like what to play at what time. So sometimes still, I mean, we, we were talking about bytes. People were were fighting over over bytes to you know. So you need to have like cut this sample just a bit out of this part and. 
And of course, we were horrified because then when you loop the, loop the sample too close, it starts to sound like a sine or a wave or something. And no, it doesn't sound like a saxophone anymore. More and that was like that was like a constant battle. All the graphic graphic people were like, no, I need these pixels here, and we were like, no, we we want this length to be like this, and we need to have these notes here. And coders were no, you can't have those, and we want this. <laughs> And talking about bytes, really, so it's, it was like pretty, pretty, yeah, now it was funny, but back then I, I, I was maybe a bit too serious back then, so maybe took it a bit too on, on my heart. But We had something to prove as, as tracker musicians that we could make music that semi stood up to the stuff that you were hearing, you know, on the radio, you hear a black box or a technotronic track or something like that. It's like, oh, cool, so I need a chord, I need a bass, I need like a sort of that typical like kick drum stuff. So I need some, ooh, hey stuff. Like, and I listened to the stuff I wrote when I was like 11 or 12. And it was, you know, it was really trying to strive for that sound and that, you know, that, that dance sound. But our, our music was never gonna be the same quality. I mean, it was always starting off with 8-bit samples. Um, and the samples were, I mean, you did the best you could, especially once, you know, you, you got a, something like a, a sampler. <laughs> you know, you, you did your best to, to sample the bits in that, that sounded good and worked well. But, you know, you were doing things like, you, you didn't have, well, you could get pocket money for your 12 inches and your 7 inches and stuff to get your instrumental cuts and things. But you'd often be on the radio, like, you know, with a tape recording, you know, I had one really high quality metal position tape that I constantly used for recording. There was one dance show on one community radio station because dance music was still underground then, you know. So you could get the dance, you know, stations. A lot of time they'd just drop the 12 inch, they wouldn't bother mixing it in. So you'd get the drum beat off the start and then something would happen, you'd get a vocal hit and they would probably be off, you know, down the corridor having a smoke. So, you know, they would leave the full 12 inch version of a track running and that was magic because that's where you'd get all your samples from and they, the, the extended mixes where the, you know, the producers were jamming on it on the studio and doing a, a special 12 inch, you know, version, which was nine minutes long. So, you know, you, you could, the way you sort of got samples had been through a few generations of, of, uh, of tapes and radio and then converted across to your computer before you captured it. And then you were like trying to manage memory and make something that, you know, fit within your sort of maximum of a 300K mod file. And it was sort of a bit snubbed out if they were too big because then the BBS boards would be like, this file's huge, you know, it better be downloaded. Otherwise it's being deleted in two days. The majority of us didn't have uh pianos or keyboards or anything to our size that we could kind of sketch out what we were going to do um and I, I guess some people some of the stuff was so complex that they must have written down ideas and whatever but but people like me who i think <laughs> didn't really know what we were doing it, 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 the the tune was writing itself and the arrangement was was being created as you were writing the the tune you know, you, you you often, for me, wouldn't know what the next um, eight bars was going to be until you got to those eight bars, and you'd probably they, they, you'd either have a melody in your mind, so you'd write the melody down first and then work out a chord sequence to go with it, or you just come up with a nice chord sequence and and then it's like oh you know okay now I need to think of some kind of melody melody to to, to, to go with it so. It, it was very much a in the moment thing, for, especially for, for me at least. Anyway, um, I, I, I'd sit there with a blank canvas and I would just start typing out, and and it was a very rhythmic. I can need to put the phone down somewhere. Um, you you used to get into a very very rhythmic sort of side of things when you're when you're editing, uh, putting in a bass line or something. You might be going. You'd be, you'd be playing the C, A, G, C, E, G, C, E, G, and then you're pressing the, the down cursor button the other way, and then you end up getting into kind of like this almost subliminal thing when you were doing it so quickly that you weren't actually thinking about it. It was just happening. A lot of people look back now and they say, why are people still using these machines for demos? Why are you still using the Amiga 500? Uh, especially the, or the, the Commodore 64, especially the Commodore 64. Why are you still going on this system? Like, have you not seen what's out there? All there's these like Mr. Boxes that have accelerators and things and extra capability. And it's like, well, 
Uh, yes, sure, but there is a barrier that says this is your piece of hardware, everyone is on the same piece of hardware. What can you do with this specific piece of hardware? It's like F1, you know, where they limit what you can do with the cars so that everyone's sort of on an equal playing field. Although, you know, there's, there's some tweaks and things you can do that obviously, you know, to push it a little harder. Um, so, you know, maybe there's a one meg expander or something like that. You know, that's okay, that's taken into the equation. But the reason we still use these systems and especially the C64 is because there's still stuff to this day that's being discovered with these systems that uh, is taking it to the next level. You know, digital audio on the Commodore 64 that sounds super clean, full motion video playback, you know, and things like that, or, uh, you know, the little sequency things with new codec ideas, like all this wild stuff that I just wish we could send some of it back through a time machine, you know? <laughs> and send it back to a BBS, a BBS operator back in 1987 with a brand new Amiga 500 and say, put this on your BBS and see what happens. And they they would be engaged for weeks. <laughs>culmination of all of the efforts that the group The Future Crew had put together ended up in a demo called Second Reality. It featured all of the skills of the group, not only the art, the programming, the music, but also the tools that they'd been making. We were, were in a very good position because when we had something like we, we need to have this kind of thing here. So we just asked Sami to incorporate it to the tracker and he actually incorporated quite a few of those. So we just, what we needed. So we got them like this, the key commands and everything. You could go quite quickly and edit everything there. Wasn't it quite incredible to be in a position where you were, you know, groundbreaking at the time? I mean, this the, you were in in a demo group making digital music that there was completely out, out of everything else that was happening at the time. Well, Amiga started it, so there were trackers on Amiga already before this, but uh, what was revolutionary was that it was this was happening on the PC. Mm. So demos on the PC were kind of like a new thing because PC wasn't really ever built for graphics, whereas Amiga was a graphics monster basically. So being able to do those graphics and that sound and that music on a PC was a big programming challenge. You know, Future Crew, um, like you say, yes, okay, it was it was big on the PC, but um, they were some of the biggest names in in the demo scene. It was it was the biggest name at the time, certainly. Um, did you start to feel famous at, at some point? I, I think there was always like better Amiga demos around, so so it sort of grounded us, I guess, pretty well. And uh, I mean, we were we weren't even in our twenties, you know. I'm a, I I think I, I was like seventeen when I wrote this second reality thing, and so it's like, uh, and yeah, you I, I guess you sort of felt that you were known around. But it never, I mean, you went to school and nobody knew what the heck you were doing. You were just doing some nerdy stuff, some nerdy music. So it's like, it, I, I think all those things didn't sort of, at least for me, I didn't feel too famous. <laughs> just tried to do good music. So that, and actually hang around with people that I really liked and uh, mm. all this. And, and if, if I really liked that people were coding and doing graphics and with the computers and I was really interested for that. Although I just stick to writing music, but that was just being around similar kind of minded people. That was just great for me. I don't know how it was for you, but there are Well, one time you did feel famous and awesome was in the assembly event when the, our demos were on the big screen and people were applauding. Ah, that, that true. felt pretty cool. Yeah. I, I do remember the, the, the gasp when Second Reality came on the on the compo, and you had the surround sound effect when, the, when it said like in surround sound on the beginning, and the sound came from like this to, to the, and people gasped. They were like, oh, 
and I was like, all right, this is gonna go well. <laughs> <laughs> so like straight, straight in the beginning. So cool. <laughs> that was actually uh, Peter's piece. So that, that really made a made a really big impact. I, I think at, uh, maybe on that, like you said, on that time, it so I, I felt a bit famous, I guess. Yeah, that was interesting how how the surround effect was done. It was Dolby surround, and you would have to have like the on the left channel you had the mono sound, and on the right channel you had the the opposite waveform, like inverted waveform, and then yeah. Dolby surround would know to put it in the rear speakers. Yeah. I I knew that. Our demos and music went quite far, but I didn't know that they. I mean, I, I I was just very like when it when our stuff got to neighboring country like in Sweden, and I was like, oh my god, this is great. This is like it's it's going to the world, out out to the world, and and, and but didn't really realize that it's went out so far. Thanks to BBSs, I guess. So um, a question for both of you then, um, separately, I guess. What are each of you uh, most proud of? And and I guess this could just be any any type of um, work that you've done over the last thirty years. Uh, well, okay, maybe I, I think the biggest or the coolest thing was that we were in Abbey Road Studios with London Symphony Orchestra recording this one uh, one concert. Tall would be bright at. It was there was some my own pieces and then arranged pieces and that experience was pretty much insane. I mean the London Symphony Orchestra is the original Star Wars orchestra. If somebody doesn't know, and the Abbey Road is a famous recording place, like for Beatles and stuff back in the day. But it really was an amazing experience. I mean the orchestra was insane in a good way. <laughs> And the, and and the, and the studio just worked really great. And yeah, I, I think that's the biggest biggest high in my career. I, I'd say. Peter. Well, demos in related. I guess I made this silly song called Catch That Goblin and it won the song contest and then I tried the same That's trick cool. again. I made a sequel to that song and it also won. Mm. Uh, well, well, okay, when I tried it the third time it didn't work out anymore, but anyway, those two were pretty high. That was it. They were, they were great pieces. Yeah, yeah there was this, I, I won this uh, Megalave convention music competition they, they, that was held in Sweden and I was in, in Finland and I think Sami or PSI or Gore called me, I think PSI, and I, I jumped on my bed so hard and I was so ecstatic that I broke it like a thousand pieces and my parents had to buy me a new one, so I guess that was my... Outside of demo scene, another thing I should be pretty proud of is the music for Bejeweled 2. It's this mobile pop game from PopCap that has become very popular and it actually uses tracker music. So yeah, it's a mobile game with tracker music and they also use this thing called MO3 encoding. So you could take a tracker song which had a huge load of high quality samples and then the MO3 encoder would take each sample and encode it to OG or MP3. And then you would get this tiny file. So you could have like a 400 kilobyte file which had 40 minutes worth of music with very high quality samples. And that worked very well for Visual 2. In terms of um being in a, a crew like that, um, in, a, in a group. Um, I watched a YouTube video recently and it was incredible to see, you know, you're all probably in your you know, teens, you're probably 19, 18, but you're, I watched this video of, um, of you guys um, making your, your, your art and it was just incredible to watch the collaboration happening right there and, and obviously you were pressing buttons and things were happening but it, it, it just it was quite phenomenal to see that all that sort of happening at that, that sort of time do, do you look back now and go wow that's quite in, insane to see all of that happening 
Well, I, it was a special moment too that we, we, like the whole Future Crew, was got together into one place to work on the demo together. A lot of the work before that was done remotely, but uh, yeah, it was pretty crazy. We traveled pretty far, like to Pori, which is a smaller <laughs> town in Finland. Uh, it was a long trip, and then we stayed there for like a week, several days, working on uh, Second Reality. It was pretty crazy. Yeah, we usually usually. After every every individually have done like things, we used to come together and finish the demo together, or or on the party place, which was getting quite tight. I, I think quite a few times actually, but also we quite often also met in a course place, and everybody went there on Helsinki. And so yeah, working really... on the party places was extra special because like it was it took place in a school. It was yeah. it Assembly nineteen ninety two? And they had switched off the ventilation and air conditioning for the summer, but we still had the place for the summer, so it was incredibly uh, stuffy and sweaty in there. I still remember that smell. It was like pizza and sweat, so and like <laughs> and millions of teenagers there, so it was quite. It still haunts me. <laughs> then somebody pulled a prank. Somebody pulled a prank. They took like a little jar of medical tar and. Uh, poured it into the uh, ventilation system. So when somebody actually finally switched on the ventilation, everything smelled like tar. <laughs> of course. Yeah, makes total sense. Yeah. Wonderful. And you also and had you the got... foot, footprints on the floor. Like uh, this, uh, people had spilled their Coca-Cola on the floor and then people worked over it in their running shoes or whatever. So the whole corridors were all full of sticky footprints everywhere. Yeah. You. It's even though I didn't write it, um, I'm still really, really proud of it. And, and, and the fact that it, it's a, it was a huge game in terms of, I mean, video games back then, the Wing Command franchise was 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 massive, uh, and that was the first game I worked on. And it's like, yeah, yeah that's yeah. cool. Going and straight in at number one, it's like basically being an being an actor now and going into your first movie being an absolute blockbuster in Hollywood, right? That's the, that's the kind of... Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> that That is exactly what it is. So it's incredible um, that, yeah, yeah, it was a great opportunity. Hopefully they and... won't kill me off with a really bad storyline at the end, though. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're safe. <laughs> so it was kind of interesting because the Omega for me was like, and the and the tracking in particular was just such a way of life it was like you know we lived in the, the country and if i wasn't hanging out with friends or doing something i was at or doing homework i was in front of the computer tracking it was just what i did as a kid and um i guess slowly throughout the years i, I became more social and kind of got into playing uh in bands i had a very good sort of group of friends who were quite musical and that was right as the grunge scene was hitting and so you know we just wanted guitars and i, you know, I started playing drums so very quickly, I, I started playing in bands and the school bands and all of that stuff. And I, I, you know, got to uni and then I just started getting into electronic music. I just met all these people who are into techno and all this electronic music and just got schooled on the current state of electronic music by all these people. What should I buy? You know, this piece of gear that I spent all my money on, you know, and this synthesizer, so you have groove box and then you've got your sampler and then you've got your mixer and then you've got your effects rack and then you've got your compressor and limiter. So, you know, you're spending every single bit of money that isn't rent or isn't going and drinking with friends at uni on music equipment, building up the studio. And you get to a point where, you know, your friends are like, oh, you should come and pay at this party and this rave and this thing and this event. And you're having to haul all this equipment around. So there was a point where I was like, oh, I just don't want to risk this equipment. I bought a new piece of gear and I was like, I'm not taking this to like a bush rave. I got invited to play at like a party that was you know, it was sort of a dusty outdoor rave at, at like two in the morning. And I was like, oh, I've got to just find something I can just play silly bangers on, you know, for fun. And I thought, I wonder if I can make the Amiga do something like, you know, that's just acceptable, you know, for for doing a live fun show. And so, yeah, I just got the Amiga out and I was like, well, what can I do with this still today? And I kept following the demo scene. I've always been into the demo scene. So I've, I've followed, you know, what some of the more eight channel or 16 32 channel tracking stuff was at and I was like wow that's getting really good so if we strip it to four channels can we get away with it 
And I went down a rabbit hole, actually took, it was the university holidays, so um, if I wasn't drinking with friends, I was at home tracking. And I did that for about 30, 40 days straight. Nothing but tracking every single day. And I just rediscovered it. I was like, this is incredible. Um, and I had all my good synths and all my gear and I was able to sample these really great sounds and had this access to this palettes of sounds that I could then, I never had as a kid. And I suddenly realized, oh, if only I'd had this back in the day, all the things I could have done. And it just became a limit. It was, I had to prove to myself what I could do with this system now as an adult. Would it have been 10? Yeah, it would have been even eight years, nine years on from actually having it in the original day. So yeah, and I played the show, not expecting much of it, but I created all these silly fun bangers with lots of samples and lots of things in. And because I didn't have to concentrate on so many parts and layers and filters on that and compression things there. Like I, I went from being very focused and very making this sort of um, this very uh, like snobbery, trancey stuff where it was just like, you know, full concentration just to having a great time with two channels of output on a filter, on a mixer and just, just getting silly and jumping around and just going nuts. And everyone was like, you have to keep doing this. This is so much better than your normal stuff. And I was, looked at $5,000 worth of gear at home and went, Damn. <laughs> the four channels of the Amiga make people way happier. They're like, oh yeah, but you're having such a good time. And I was like, and I had a, a little light bulb moment of that's it, you know, it's the rock the party vibe. And when you've got two channels and you've got like, you can do some channel mutes and there's a few things, you can call up macros and break, but you, you've got just enough where you can have a really, really good time. Still tweak the track and make it a version that someone hasn't heard before because you're changing the ordering and you're changing the way you know, you're on the filters or doing the effects or the ramp ups, but yeah, I just, just discovered that the Amiga was was quite a good party rocking machine. And yeah, so in, in, in question to how did people get to know about the Amiga stuff is I, well, I, I started putting some YouTube videos out in the early sort of YouTube days and um, I don't know, and, and my tracks at various demo parties and people just heard them. And I got a couple of demo party organizers in Europe who heard my stuff and were like, oh, it sounds like you're having a really good time and I've seen some videos of you jumping around and it's this huge kind of party vibe and there's people in giraffe suits and there's like, you know, lasers and there's mirror balls and, you know, can you bring that vibe to our party? And it's like, sure, you know, just hook me up with the 1200 and I brought my system and borrowed a 1200 and would just start playing, I guess, demo parties. And then from there, the chip scene, I guess, you know, once you learn how to track for one system, it's very easy to pick up another system and start tracking on it and you try to do on a Game Boy, you know, the sort of sounds and things you were getting off your Amiga because you want to push it as hard as you can. So very quickly I picked up the other tracker formats that were starting to emerge for the 8-bit um, platforms and I got recognised quite early on in the global chip scene as someone who was like, oh well this person pushes tracking to its limit. Um, yeah, and so I guess from that I got to play in Blip Festival in New York City and, and in Tokyo and, and a bunch of demo parties in Europe and and then that kind of branched out to slowly being radio and people on YouTube seem to take an interest on the production sort of values behind this stuff. So you chuck out a video on tracking and a few hundred thousand people watch it and I don't know, it's just like you just do it and love it and put it out there and slowly people hear it and yeah. So um, obviously the music that you, you guys um, produced, a lot of it was on bulletin boards. Um, it was, was dis distributed on bulletin boards. Was, it, was there any um, fun you guys had with bulletin boards back in the day or was it, um, did you keep out of the bulletin board scene? I was living in Turku and uh, calling between cities was expensive. So I would call the BBSs in Turku. Uh, and uh, one thing that, kind of negative thing that Screen Tracker, the first Screen Tracker did was that because it was able to import Amiga mods, uh, people would uh, like import an Amiga mod to Screen Tracker, save it as a Screen Tracker tracker file and upload it to a BBS. So a lot of Amiga tracker songs spread as Screen Tracker songs in the BBSs. But the thing is that the import wasn't perfect. So the songs did not yeah. play correctly. So the portamentos could be wrong. Uh, so it would sound like out of tune sometimes. And uh, Amiga demo seniors thought that this was a crime against Amiga music, really. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was also like because it was very expensive. It's, I also stayed on the Turku area, the same as, as 
teacher, so and uh, I, I was a coach you saw, with my friend when I was in in high school for some years. We had this data cave called BBS. And that was so cool. People were well, you know, though obviously everybody knows who's watching this series knows what's there, but it was very exciting for a young person to be involved in. And afterwards, I, I think when phone phone fees came smaller, it was possible to call everywhere. I, I think when Starboard, it was the, basically the future crew headquarters, PBS. So quite often I, I, I did go there and check out the newest mods and, and newest music and it, well, what everybody was writing. I, I think there was some RPG things going on also. I was playing with some of the friends on, on some of the PBSs. As well. That was pretty exciting, actually. I I personally uh, had my own BBS when I was a kid, and uh, the That's name cool. of of the BBS um, was Purple Motion BBS because I was a huge oh, big fan. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> wow! <Cool. laughs> yeah. So yeah, no. So my mom and dad they they um they thought it was hilarious um, because they did they had absolutely no idea what it was all about, and they they thought. <laughs> They thought purple motion was something pretty rude, um, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> it does sound a bit rude now if, if you think about it. But it, it wasn't actually it. purple motion. I, I mean, it came from Deep Purple. I loved the band when I was young, so I just I thought the I thought it was cool. And at back then, all the cool guys like tracker people had like two part names, you know, Jesper Kid or whatever. And well, that, that's actually his all. Oh, oh, Real name, I, I think, but like what, whatever. Oh, Uncle actually, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought that I ha had to have like a two-part name as well. So I sort of picked. That's how I picked it. It wasn't anything rude back then, at least. But yeah, true. It sounds a bit like. Yeah. Okay. And um, wow. and Skaven is Skaven, Skaven something to do with sort of like. Warhammer or something like that, was it? Yeah, at the time I was reading, uh, well, I never played Warhammer much, but I loved the setting and I was reading the rule books just for the fiction in them. And I thought that was would make a cool demo scene alias. I might regret it a little bit, but I, I have to stick with it. So later I added 252 to it, Skaven 252, because 252 is in hexadecimal, it's FC, which can stand for future crew. I don't know whether it's nostalgia, whether it's something else, but um, it, it, it's, you know, from that period of your life, uh, it's something quite unique and it's great to get involved with. So I, I, I dare say that it, it might be a wee bit similar for you, um, making track of music back in, in this current day. Well, I mean, the thing is, we're, we're, we're all getting older. Um, and, and we're and everybody that I've spoken to, um, the older they are, the, the quicker they feel they're getting older. You know, time speeds up and speeds up and speeds up. And I think, you know, you get to a certain point, and I think for me it was probably my, my mid-40s, um, and, and, and you, you, you see that there's an end to this, what was a never-ending tunnel when you were 20 or 16. Um, and then these 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 things that you that you got into back back in your teens and whatever i think then become even more important to you um and part part sort of like the the memories but 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 just part as well sort of like if you can spur those memories to come back again that that's not not a bad thing and i think i think it's quite nice just to relive this stuff um and i get i mean there's there's certain amiga tracker tunes now which wowed me back back in the day probably for different reasons um, because the beauty of tracker was to be able to download some of these mods probably you know tip and mantronics and firefox and heat beaten and, and whatnot and 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 study how they put their things together and learn from it and obviously we're all stealing everybody's samples as well um, but <laughs> There's some really, really bloody good music there as well, even by today's standards. Um, and OK, it's four channel, it's eight bit, um, but it's got character. Um, um, and, and some of this stuff on, on, on the Amiga, when you've, you've also got to bear in mind the age of the people writing it. You know, I mean, you go back to the Commodore 64 days and you, you think about people like Euro and Tell 
writing all these tunes for um, cybernoids and, 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 and whatnot. Um, and he was like 15, 16. It's like, <gasps> just talent oozing out of every orifice. I'm really appreciative of, of the quality and the talent of this stuff that was being done. Um, and it wasn't easy, you know, I mean, you had limitations and, and that's that's one of the things that I still love about all this stuff is limitations make you work in a different way, you know, whether it's writing pieces of music on, on, on an Amiga or whether it's it, it's doing audio design for, for a video game with, with little memory or, or whatever, it, 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 it makes you work in a different way and kind of everything improving all the time ruins that makes things too easy for people um and then people get lazy and then they they, they don't get creative because everything's done for them and and I, there's there's a beauty to all of that old stuff in 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 how it nurtured people to try and get the best out of it you know In the next episode of Back to the BBS, we discover the art scene, a thriving scene full of budding artists that do ASCII, ANSI and various other types of art besides. Stay tuned for that, it's all coming up soon here on Al's Geek Lab. In the meantime, thanks very much for watching, and if you'd like to support the documentary, then please check out our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash Al's Geek Lab. the demo scene alive. Yeah, yeah, that's like, that's like...